Good morning everyone, my name is Carol Mikolak and welcome to today's webinar. Our series of webinars have been running now since 2020 and if you've missed any you can go back and review them all on demand right here on our YouTube channel. You can also catch up on our learning hub at www.proctorgroup.com where you can also book in for follow-ups with our team of experts around the country, access up-to-date information on our full range of products or order product samples. Today's webinar is the third in our series of Toolbox Talks, focusing on installation and site practice, and we'll be looking at our Spacetherm Aerogel insulation systems. We'll begin with an overview of the basics of thermal insulation and how it affects moisture movement in buildings. We'll then run through some of the frequently asked installation questions and common situations found on site. Our space therm range of high performance thermal insulation systems are based around a silica aerogel matting, which is both hydrophobic and vapour permeable. Aerogel itself is a very low density solid that, so the story goes, was invented in the 1930s by the American chemical engineer Stephen Kistler in order to win a bet. An aerogel is a gel in which the liquid is replaced by gas without shrinking via a complex process called supercritical drying. Raw silica aerogel is essentially puffed up sand, best described as being to sand what a rice crispy is to rice. The resultant structure is 97% air entrapped in nano-sized pores. And while a superb thermal insulator is very brittle, limiting its practical applications. Our space therm systems use a modified form of this aerogel impregnated into a fibrous carrier mat. This results in a flexible and robust material with a thermal conductivity of 0.015 watts per meter Kelvin, making it amongst the best thermal insulants in use today. Because the aerogel insulation blanket contains no blowing agents, it does not release harmful gases into the building over time. Extensive testing has also shown no degradation in performance over a 50 year period. Variants of space therm aerogel are also available with reaction to fire classifications up to A1, making these products suitable for use in almost any situation. We can supply this insulation in a variety of composite panels and systems to suit a variety of application in both new build and refurbishment projects, and we'll discuss these shortly. First, let's take a brief look at how insulation performance is quantified and how thermal performance and moisture management are interlinked. When we talk about insulation levels in buildings, we generally refer to U-values, which quantifies how fast heat flows through a specific part of the building. In this case, we'll consider a wall. U-values can also be referred to thermal transmittance, and a lower U-value indicates better thermal insulation. A typical solid brick wall of the type found in older buildings across the UK will usually have a U-value of 2.1 watts per metre squared Kelvin compared to a new build wall, which will usually be in the region of 0.15 to 0.2, depending on what regulations you're working to. This falls a long way short. As we move towards reducing energy consumption, addressing this shortfall in performance in older buildings is critically important, not least in terms of reducing fuel poverty and improving the indoor environment. The U value is calculated by taking the inverse of the sum of the total thermal resistance of the wall. This thermal resistance, or R value, is measured in metres squared Kelvin per watt. And in our example wall here, 220 millimetres of solid brickwork with a plaster skim has a thermal resistance of 0.31 metres squared Kelvin per watt, the inverse of which gives us our 2.1 U value. Higher R values indicate higher levels of insulation, i.e. more resistance to the passage of heat energy. It's also worth remembering that the relationship between U values and R values is not linear. As U values get lower, exponentially more R value is required to make a further improvement. So upgrading our example wall from 2.1 to 1 requires substantially less insulation than upgrading from 1 to 0.3. If we want to upgrade this to reach a U-value of 0.3, we must increase the R-value by 2.88. A U-value of 0.3 is the best case for upgraded walls, given in approved document L for England and Wales, 
but similar values are given in Section 6 for Scotland and Technical Booklet F1 for Northern Ireland. Technical Guidance Document L in the Republic of Ireland looks for 0 0.35. In all these cases, however, there are specific exceptions made if meeting these values is not technically or economically feasible, so the exact value can vary from project to project. To keep things simple for now, though, we'll stick to 0 0.3 for our example today. So what insulation has an R value of 2.88? R values are calculated by dividing the thickness of a material in metres by its thermal conductivity, or lambda value, which is measured in watts per metre Kelvin. The lower the thermal conductivity, the better insulation a material provides. Metals like steel have very high thermal conductivities, with stone and bricks being much lower, and timber even lower still. Materials that are used for insulation have thermal conductivities even lower, with mineral fibre being between 0.035 to 0.044, polystyrene foam 0.032 to 0.038, and polyurethane and phenolic foams 0.018 to 0.025. The aerogel blankets we use in space therm are between 0.015 and 0.0195, depending on the fire rating requirements. Taking the lowest value for each material, we need the following thicknesses to get an R value of 2.88. 100 mm for mineral fibre, 92 mm for polystyrene, 52 mm for phenolic foam, and 44 mm for aerogel. Simply adding the R value together to get a U value doesn't tell the whole story though, as insulation layers may be placed between timber studs or may be penetrated by fixings such as screws and nails. There may also be air gaps in the layers. All of these can affect thermal performance, so various correction factors are applied to the calculation to account for these. The method for applying these corrections and the conventions as to how and when they are applied are explained fully in the ISO 6946 2017 standard and the BRE guidance documents BR443 2019. In most cases, the easiest way to ensure calculations are done correctly is to use U-value calculation software. If you visit our website at www.proctorgroup.com, we have a free online calculation tool available to registered users which can provide project-specific calculations using data from an extensive library of building materials. You can also save multiple calculations for a project, collaborate with other users in your team, and send your calculations for review by our experts before printing off fully compliant reports for building control. The calculator can also use location-specific climate data to generate condensation risk analysis using the ISO 13788 Glazer method. You can define site locations using either UK postcodes or with latitude and longitude. The amount, type and placement of insulation in an upgraded wall can have a big effect on the condensation risk and we'll move on to discuss that now. The management of heat and moisture in buildings are fundamentally linked and any changes to the thermal insulation must also be assessed for their impact on moisture movement, particularly in older buildings which use traditional materials and techniques like lime plaster. The balance of heat and moisture flows in these buildings must be carefully considered, so now we'll take a look at the interaction between heat flow and moisture flow. In our solid brick wall example, Without any insulation, the temperature within the wall decreases pretty uniformly from inside to outside. The heat in the building interior also pushes moisture through the wall by means of vapour pressure. This pressure is created by the internal temperature and humidity. As long as water vapour is kept above a certain temperature, it will remain as vapour and diffuse outwards through the wall. But if it cools below what's called its dew point, it will revert to liquid water. This process is what causes bathroom mirrors to mist up or water droplets to form on cold drinks cans. By comparing the dew point with the temperature gradient, we can predict if and where there is a risk of condensation occurring in the building fabric. Adding insulation to the wall will change this dynamic in two ways. Firstly, the temperature gradient will alter, with the temperature dropping through the insulation layer rather than the masonry. 
this will also result in the brickwork of the wall becoming colder. Secondly, the insulation will affect the way moisture can move through the wall, which in turn will alter the dew point. An insulation which is highly vapour resistant, such as foil faced polyurethane foam, will limit the ingress of moisture from the heated space and reduce the dew point through the wall. While this might seem to present an ideal solution, there is an important downside, and one which cannot be modelled using the ISO 13788 method. The Glazer method, given in ISO 13788, assumes that moisture only flows from inside to outside, and that the indoor environment is the only source of moisture. It also omits the ability of the building fabric to store and release moisture. For most types of buildings, these effects do not significantly affect the result of a dew point analysis, but in the case of our solid example wall, they can play a greater role. In a solid wall, moisture from rainfall is absorbed directly by the wall, which can then store this moisture until it dries out. In an uninsulated wall, this moisture dries out outwards, driven by the internal heat sources, but also inwards, driven by warm and sunny summer weather. This high-performance rigid foam insulation board has impacted both these processes and heat from inside no longer drives moisture outwards to the same extent and inward drying is also limited. Because the aerogel blankets we use in the Space Therm products are vapour permeable, this inward drying can still take place, but this must be balanced against the high level of moisture ingress that a permeable insulation allows. Our team of technical experts can use a more complex moisture analysis using the methods from BSEN15026 to model this process dynamically. This assessment can take into account the effects of weather and moisture storage as well as drying out in any direction. This assessment can be used to determine what level of vapour resistance is optimal for a specific project and vapour control measure, such as integrated foil layers, can be specified accordingly. When upgrading a building, it's important to consider the effects of thermal bridging. We mentioned earlier how this can occur at fixings and where structural materials penetrate insulation layers, but maintaining the continuity of insulation is important in other areas too. Door and window openings are a particular problem here as it's not always feasible to add a substantial thickness of insulation without encroaching on the window or door. It is, however, important to add as much insulation to these areas as possible. Although it might seem like these areas will not significantly affect the overall heat loss, when insulation is added to the main parts of the wall, these areas will become colder than they were prior to the application of the insulation. This happens because less heat is able to reach the masonry wall through the upgraded insulation. Because these areas become colder, it is more likely that a surface condensation risk will occur where the warm, moist internal air meets the cold masonry. Insulating these areas even to a lesser extent than the main wall will help counteract this condensation risk and it's here that space therm is particularly useful. Even just 10 millimetres of aerogel applied to these areas will make the internal surface temperature far more uniform and warmer, leading to a significant reduction in surface condensation risk. There are a range of space therm systems available to fit more or less any project requirement. Most systems can be supplied in a variety of thicknesses and with or without integrated vapour control layers. Before we move on to discussing the installation processes, Let's briefly review the range of systems and their applications. The blankets of insulation can be supplied unfaced as a multi-purpose high performance insulation blanket, which is available with an A1 fire rating. Firstly, we have Space Therm Wallboard, a straightforward traditional plasterboard thermal laminate board. This is supplied in standard plasterboard sheet sizes and is fixed to existing timber studwork timber battens, or to the underside of rafters. Space Therm Wallboard is supplied with an integrated vapour control layer, but this can be omitted on request, resulting in a fully vapour permeable board. Space Therm Direct Fix takes the Space Therm Wallboard laminate and adds a layer of robust plywood reinforcement, which allows the board to be directly fixed to suitable solid substrates using shot-fired fixings. This removes the need to provide timber battens, hence saving further thickness, 
and is made possible by the hydrophobic nature of the insulation layers. Because space therm aerogel does not absorb liquid water, it can be placed directly against masonry without additional damp proofing. Not all masonry is suitable for the direct fix method, however. So if in doubt, contact our technical teams for pro project specific advice. Space Therm Multi replaces the plasterboard with a 6mm magnesium oxide facing board, providing a dual purpose board that is suitable for use in wall and floor applications. The boards are also available in 1200 by 2400 or 1200 by 600 panel sizes for easier site handling on projects with restricted access such as loft conversions. The inherent moisture permeability of both the Space Therm Aerogel and the magnesium oxide facings make it a good option for floors where the presence or condition of damp proofing may be unknown. Depending on the floor construction, there's a limit to the usable thickness of the space there multi for flooring applications. However, our technical team can advise and discuss alternative solutions. Space therm wall liner comprises aerogel insulation bonded to a durable 3mm magnesium oxide facing board and fixed in place internally using a gap filling adhesive. After applying a primer, the panels can then be jointed, skimmed, then painted and decorated in the same way as a normal plasterboard wall. It is supplied in a 1200 by 600 mm panel, weighing just 4.9 kilograms, meaning that sheets are easily handled by one person and can be easily moved to hard to reach areas or stored on site without affecting access. Once installed, the system provides a significant reduction in heat loss with a nominal 13 mm increase in wall thickness, meaning in most cases, sockets, switches, and TV and network points can be left in situ and features such as cornices and window sills can be left as is, with no modification required. Wrap Therm combines the thermal performance of aerogel and the low air leakage rates of a wrap tight air barrier membrane into one system. Sheets of Wrap Therm can be directly adhered to suitable substrates to limit both cold bridging and unplanned air movement in one process. Wrap Therm sheets can also be cut down into strips and adhered to steelwork to reduce localised cold bridging. As wrap therm is fully vapour permeable, it does not adversely affect the movement of moisture through stonework. This helps limit damage that can occur when moisture flow through older stonework is altered by upgrade works. As well as protecting the existing building fabric, wrap therm's hydrophobic properties provide a secondary barrier to water ingress and by sealing tightly to door and window frames and other penetrations. Designed to prevent cold bridging through a component or element of a structure, Space Therm CBS, cold bridge strip, consists of Space Therm aerogel insulation encapsulated in durable polyethylene with integrated double-sided tape for ease of installation. Space Therm CBS is an ideal choice for timber or steel frame structures and on request can be cut to a variety of widths to suit different applications. In addition to timber and steel structures, it can also be used in other applications where cold bridging is an issue, such as concrete columns, foundation details, and many others. For fire rated applications, Space Therm CBS will be supplied as just blanket strips with no facings. We'll now move on to take a look at the practicalities of working with Space Therm on site. Because Space Therm comes in a variety of different systems for a huge range of applications, today we'll mainly focus on general installation guidance that applies whatever the circumstances. Our team have worked on projects of all sizes all over the world, so whatever project specific requirements you have, it's unlikely to be something we haven't come across before. So please get in touch for more specific guidance. As we discussed earlier, Space Therm is a composite insulation blanket combining silica aerogel with a fibrous carrier to provide strength and flexibility. In addition to providing a very low thermal conductivity, the resultant material is both vapour permeable and hydrophobic. This means Space Therm can be used in a wide range of construction application on almost any type of structure. The insulation contains no blowing agents, so does not give off gas, and extensive test data shows no loss of thermal performance over a 50-year period. 
The range of space therm systems comprises this material bonded to a range of facing boards to suit specific applications. Space therm board should be stored securely, under cover and protected from weather, similarly to standard plasterboard sheets. Care should be taken when sorting and handling boards to ensure they are kept flat and well supported, as the additional weight and flexibility of the aerogel mats can lead to the facing material cracking if the boards bend excessively. Packing and wrapping should not be removed until immediately prior to installation, to minimise the potential for dust spreading on site. Working with space therm aerogel can produce a lot of dust as the boards are handled and cut, and minimising this is an important part of the installation process. The best way to avoid dust spread is to ensure that the process is well planned and access around the worksite is as limited as possible. Preparatory work, like relocating services and any repair work to substrates, should be carried out beforehand so the installation of the space therm boards can proceed uninterrupted. Likewise, access to the worksite should be restricted only to personnel required to conduct the installation and the number of access points minimised. Any unnecessary doors or windows should be closed and sealed for the duration of the installation. When working with space therm, the use of PPE is recommended, in addition to dust control measures. Because the dust is hydrophobic in nature, it can cause drying and irritation of the skin and eyes, so the use of gloves, goggles and a suitable dust mask or respirator is advisable. Particularly when cutting space therm boards, Local dust distraction systems should be used if available. Full material safety information is available from our technical department. Cutting space therm boards is best done outside if possible, but if it must be done indoors, ensure the area is well ventilated. If cutting indoors, it's also a good idea to use plastic sheeting to contain dust. If mechanical saws have a provision to fit local dust extraction, such systems should be used. The boards can be cut with a handsaw if necessary, but mechanical cutting with a jigsaw or circular saw are generally more straightforward. In all cases when cutting, it is important to make sure the board is well supported, and cuts should always be made from the internal facing side. Cutouts required for switches, sockets or other services can be made in the normal manner, by drilling corners, then cutting out with the jigsaw. It's worth bearing in mind, however, that such cutouts lead to localised cold bridging, so avoiding placing the services on the external wall is always preferable if possible. Space therm multi and wallboard can be fixed to timber battens or stud work using standard drywall screws. Space therm multi, due to its harder surface, may require countersinking first to provide a smooth finish and recess of screws. Timber battens, should be at least 25mm deep and secured to the substrate using fixings appropriate to the substrate and anticipated loadings. Battens should also be spaced at 400mm centres maximum, properly located to support all board joints and edges and protected with a strip of DPC if necessary. The space therm boards should be secured to the timber using drywall screws equivalent to the thickness of the space therm board plus 25mm at no greater than 300mm centres and at all edges and joints. Detailed guidance is given in the BS8212 Code of Practice for dry lining, and it's a good idea to review this before undertaking the installation. When fixing to solid masonry, direct short-fired fixings are an option that can be considered with both space therm multi and plywood reinforced space therm direct fix boards. Before installing boards this way, it's important to make sure the masonry substrate is suitable for fixing in this manner, because there is less scope for levelling than is the case with timber battens. Particularly, care must be taken to ensure the substrate is straight and level. If this is not the case, or if large voids will be left behind the insulation boards, the use of a parge coat over the masonry should be considered to level up the surface and ensure the boards can sit flat. If a parge coat is used, additional length should be added to the fixings to ensure they penetrate the parge coat into solid masonry beneath. Fixings should be shot fired at maximum 500mm centres horizontally and vertically, ensuring all board edges and corners are properly fixed. 
Power settings for nail guns will vary according to the type of tool and substrate, so detailed guidance from the tool and fixing suppliers should be sought prior to installation. Fixings should be at least the board thickness plus 25mm, with extra added to any parge coat if necessary. Space therm wall liner boards are fixed directly to a continuous solid substrate wall by using Insta-Stick Foam Adhesive. Assemble the adhesive gun following the manufacturer's instructions and make sure that the substrate wall is as clean and dust-free as possible. Start in a lower corner of the wall and begin by placing the first wall liner board on the floor with the MGO side facing down. Apply a bead of adhesive around the full perimeter of the board, maintaining a 30mm distance from the edge, then zigzag adhesive across the entire board surface. Ensure the edges of the board are well supported by adhesive. Holding the board at the edges, carefully lift it into position onto the wall and make sure the adhesive side makes good contact with the substrate wall and that any cutouts match. Gently press the board against the wall, holding until sufficient adhesion occurs. As per the instructions on the adhesive, a second pushback against the substrate and levelling should be carried out after approximately five minutes. The first row of wall liner boards should be supported by existing skirting boards or a batten. Continue this process, tiling the boards across the wall, either staggered or in line. Where boards meet at a corner, it's important to make sure the layers of insulation overlap continuously without leaving a gap to form a cold bridge. For an external angle, the insulation boards should extend beyond the edge by a distance equal to the insulation thickness of the panel. The insulation layer on the other panel is then trimmed by an equivalent distance, allowing the boards to intersect. On an internal angle, this is reversed, with the board facing trimmed back rather than the insulation. After fixing the boards, the joint is taped and any gaps filled. Metal reinforcing can be used for added strength if necessary. Please note, Self-adhesive glass fibre tape is not suitable for use with the MGO board, therefore alternative tape should be utilised. The plasterboard and magnesium oxide finishes of the space therm boards can be jointed, plastered and decorated more or less the same way as uninsulated wall board. Prior to application of plaster, both at joints and as a skim coat, it's important to make sure the boards are free of dust as this may cause issues with plaster adhesion. Dust removal is made far simpler by using a vacuum cleaner. Prior to taping, plastering or decorating the magnesium oxide facing on space stem wall liner and space stem multiboards, we recommend the use of the appropriate primer to prepare the surface. For finishing with plaster skim, our plaster bond primer should be used and for painting or papering, we have an acrylic primer. These should be applied and left to cure as per instructions that are supplied with them. These primers are specifically designed for use with the MGO wall boards as traditional plasterboard primers are not suitable. Finally, the space therm boards do not provide sufficient strength to allow the fixing of shelves, kitchen units or TV brackets to the laminate board alone. Any such fixings should be made into the masonry substrate or onto timber studwork. In a floor application, Space Star Multi is laid over a structural base as a floating floor. So before starting, it's important to ensure the existing floor is level and free of any movement. As with walls, any necessary repair work should be undertaken prior to installing the Space Therm boards. Boards should be laid starting from the corner furthest from the point of access and properly aligned to allow a straight joint with the next run of panels. Joints should be staggered a minimum of 200mm between rows and an expansion gap should be left at perimeters. Flanking strips can be added at the perimeters if required. Once the boards are laid, butt joints between sheets and perimeters should be sealed using wrap tight tape to control dust movement between adjacent panels. It may be necessary to clean the panels prior to applying the tape to ensure good adhesion to the surface. Space Air Multi is similar to an acoustic floating floor in terms of movement, so while flexible floor coverings can be used with no special measure, rigid coverings such as tiles or laminate may require special measures such as flexible adhesive or plywood overlay. 
If fitting this type of floor covering, the advice of the flooring supplier should be sought to confirm if this is needed. Due to the compressible nature of Space Therm, we recommend that any thickness over 20mm is discussed with our technical team for suitability. Installing the Wrap Therm system is similar to working with our Wrap Tight Vapour Permeable Membrane, and similar installation conditions apply. Wrap Therm can be applied to most timber, masonry and metal substrates provided the surface is dry and free from dust, loose material and other contaminants. It's also important to make sure the surface is smooth and free of any lumps, ridges and sharp protrusions. Wrap Therm should be installed on dry surfaces when temperatures are above freezing to ensure a good bond is achieved. On very rough or porous substrates, the use of a primer can be considered to ensure optimal bonding of the wrap type component. The sheets of wrap therm should be pre-cut to fit the wall and around any doors and window openings or structural elements present. The sheets have a 50mm lap edge where the wrap type membrane extends beyond the insulation layer and joints and sheet positions should take this into account. The airtight layer should be kept continuous with adjacent sheets lapped, not butted. Strips of wrap tight tape can be used under joists to ensure this if a butt joint is unavoidable or at corners and openings. The simplest way to install self adhesive sheets is to peel back the release liner 150mm at the top edge of the sheet, then fix this in place. Work from the centre outwards using firm pressure with a hand roller. The liner can then be removed working downwards with the roller used to remove air bubbles and ensure a good bond is achieved. So, that concludes today's toolbox talk. Let's now move on to the Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending our seventh webinar of 2023. Um, so we now have over 120,000 views of our webinars to date. Um, so we hope to continue to grow that throughout the rest of the year. Um, as you know, we will try our best to stay and answer all of your questions. Um, so please ask them here on YouTube and um, email us at webinar at proctorgroup.com or you can also DM us on Twitter at proctorgroup. Um, if you'd like to request a product sample pack around some of the products that were discussed today, so Space Therm, um, you can do that on our web webinar page, which is on our website, www.proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar. Um, you can also um, discuss a project, book a meeting with one of our staff and download your personalised CPD certification for today's webinar is available at that same place. Uh, my name is Kira Proctor and I'm the Managing Director here at the Proctor Group. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our panel um, before informing you of the next webinar date. So if I can start with uh, Pamela Howitt. Morning, Pam. Pam is our Senior Technical Advisor. Morning, Kira. Good morning. Uh, Mark Blackie is our Regional Sales Manager, Technical Sales Manager. Morning, Mark. Good morning, Kira. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Jay Finch. Good morning, Jay. He is our Specification Sales Manager. Morning, all. And Technical Director, a bit late to the party, Ian Ferrington. Hi, morning everybody. Good morning, Kira. Good morning, good morning. Um, so a very quick date for um, the diary for those of you that, that are monthly viewers. Um, our next webinar is on Friday the 25th of August at 10am and it's a REBA accredited CPD on air leakage and fire performance in facade systems. So a really interesting one. Um, so that'll have an over, overview of the UK and Irish building regulations um, relating to the compliance of construction membranes with respect to air leakage and uh, reaction to fire. Um, it really helps us if you enjoyed the webinar today, if you like it, and also please subscribe to our channel. That keeps you informed of everything that we have up and coming. It's not all live webinars, um, with various videos, installation information, etc. So please subscribe and then you'll be able to be kept informed. So I hope you can, can join us on the 25th of August, Friday at 10 a.m. as usual. And um, so I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in on the YouTube feed, which is fantastic. And we've had some via Twitter and web and uh, email as well. So please bear with me. Um, so I'm just going to start in the order that they have come in uh, with um, Alan Crawford. So if I can come to you, please, Jay. Um, Alan has asked, just bear with me one second. Alan has asked, um, let me find Alan's question. Apologies. Um, 
Can you mix and match to use the space serum to incorporate insulated cavity plus space serum wall linings internally to achieve U values? Mm-hmm. Um, I see, Alan, you're from London. So hello, I'm down south as well. Maybe we can meet at some point. Um, it, it's actually a really valid question. Just scrolling down as well, Kira, that someone else has asked about um, using it as space therm all over. I assume in that respect, what we're talking about is essentially having it as an internal wall insulation. Well, the answer is yes. Um, in, in the truest sense, yes, you can use it all over, but in a practical sense, it's often cost prohibitive. So it's, it's a common misconception to say you have to kind of use it throughout. So if you use the example that you have there about using it against uh, a cavity wall, for example, if you've got a solid wall or otherwise an existing dwelling, given the expectations we see in, in the decreasing U values, this kind of focus we have on this kind of academic process, it's often unachievable to put these big thick wall sections in with more and more insulation. So in that sense, it makes an absolute you know, commercial bias and that a really good move to put a standardized piece of insulation, assuming it is therefore appropriate in terms of its permeability and air movement, et cetera, and then combine a small piece of, of space that marriage are with it, have this kind of lamination. That can very often be enough to tip that balance and just bring those u values in your favor without exponentially having these big, thick, very unchievable sections, which of course impacts on, on room size and everything else. I hope that kind of answers it. But ultimately, yes, if you're trying to achieve a U-value, combining different materials is a really sensible way of doing that for lots of different ways. Good. Thank you, Jay. Um, Ian, if I can come to you just to address Alan's uh, further comment. So what about with insulation between timber rafters combined with insulated plasterboard below rafters? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Jay's done a great job of explaining how you can use different materials. And I think that's one of the benefits of, of proctors is that we can, we're insulation agnostic, so we can talk about different types of insulation and how they can work best for the health of the building. So Jay's answer was absolutely perfect. And similarly with the rafters, you can mix and match depending on the vapor permeability of the insulation to ensure that the building is insulated to the required standards but also healthy in terms of its breathability. So yeah, you can uh, mix and match in the rafters as well. Good stuff. And Ian, if I can come to you on Ensign Design's question as well, please. Um, so they said, hi, I've used space and wall lender bonded to masonry, but I'm getting some movement cracking, principally on the horizontal joints. Can you suggest some secondary mechanical fixings to, present, uh, to prevent this? Yeah, I think um, it's unfortunate that there's any cracking obviously um but these things happen and depending on the type of wall that it's been fixed to um the wall liner is designed to be adhered onto the wall um and there can be some movement um, and it depends on why there is that movement there we would want to have a look at that but yes principally you shouldn't be putting fixings in it but there are circumstances as ones that have been uh, identified, if there is movement, you can put fixings in that to tighten it up, depending on the torque, to tighten it up and make it smooth. So, yeah, you can use fixings uh, if required, but there is a degree of cold bridging there. OK, well, we have a question on cold bridging, so if I can stick with you, Ian, actually. Melissa's just asked on YouTube, um, do fixings per shelving fixed furniture back to the substrate to create thermal bridging from internal to structure? Is there a particular advice to present, prevent any damage to space there? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we do advise that the fixings are always put back where you've got particular weights, like shelves, um, that you put that back to the, the main structure, the masonry. And yeah, logically that does create a cold bridge because you're penetrating with a metal fixing through the insulation. Um, so yeah, but as long as it's local, it's okay. Um, you wouldn't have a lot in the in the one board because um, then that would affect the um, U values that you're doing. But if it's localized, yeah, it, it is a potential cold bridge. Um, but it wouldn't cause a, a major issue if it's just localised. Okay, perfect. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come to you for uh, a technical sales manager one um, from Joseph. Is space therm expensive to purchase and install? Oh, right. Well, 
I guess compared to other uh, installations to achieve a, a particular U value, then, then the answer would be yes. But as a rough rule of thumb, there's a like for like performance with, with half the thickness uh, when comparing uh, space therm to a, say, a fully breathable uh, fibrous in, uh, insulation such as glass wool or, or mineral wool. So if you applied that across the whole wall, you would save a, a considerable amount of space. And if you consider that in a commercial setting, that would possibly allow you to maximize any rental uh, 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 potential because they're often priced per square foot. So in essence, there could be some rent trade-offs with the with the uh, increased space uh, without reducing any thermal performance. When it comes to installation, probably as the, hopefully the, the toolbox talk has, uh, has shown, it's a pretty straightforward process with a speedy installation. So we wouldn't expect any uh, uh, any additional onerous uh, installation costs over and above, say, uh, a dry lining installation. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. That's fantastic. Um, questions coming in thick and fast, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Pam, if I can come to you, please. I've not forgotten about you. Um, Paul has asked a good question. Um, any special considerations um, for using an MGO board for finishing? So she's not used an MGO board before. Anything she needs to consider if she's utilising them? Yeah, um, it was obviously touched on a little bit in the, the toolbox talk, but do you know, actually MGO is a great product to use because it's really quite dense compared to plasterboard. So it's great for sort of like higher traffic areas or it's why it's a favourite one for things like window reveals and door reveals where they tend to be a little bit more at risk of knocking in small areas. Um, really in terms of handling the board and cutting it, it's not much different to... Um, plasterboard in that respect or any sort of cement particle type board um, in terms of finishing it you can't treat it the same way as you would plasterboard so normally on things like wallboard etc uh, with plasterboard finish you would just paint a pvc or uh, a watered down um, emulsion on it to sort of like seal the surface before you start plastering or skimming or decorating with the mgo you do need to use a specific um primer for it and we can supply those primers as part of your order and it's really important to use the correct ones because they have been developed specifically for our MGO board that we use. So if you're going to um, paint directly onto it and you're going to um, paper on it then our MGO primer which is an acrylic primer is ideal. If you're going to skim it, which will give you a, a better finish in the overall um, scheme of things, and even if you're looking at maybe like tiling on it, where you've got like the grout and adhesive on it, it would be better to use the plasterbone primer. So that coats the surface and it actually provides a key as well. And it's probably important to say that for those that are worried about breathability, these primers are breathable, so they won't compromise um, that permeability of your wall. Um, so, yeah, and, and just to reiterate as well, what we said in the webinar, don't use the self-adhesive glass fibre scrims. So anything that's paper or non-self-adhesive <laughs> is okay, if that makes sense. Um, there's just some reaction between that, that self-adhesive version, which just doesn't seem to, to like the joints. Okay, good. And of course, we can help in terms yeah. of if, if people have specific questions or project based, we have some good ones coming by email, which I'm going to read out shortly. And um, then the team in house, we've got a team of um, five technical uh, individuals, Pam being one of, uh, can help you with those applications. Pam, can I stick with you, please? Yeah. Um, a question from Alan said, great system, wondering about how the system can be used for retrofitting. So loads of advantages, but what about socket boxes, other cold bridges, since the layer is so thin? Yeah. It's a great question. We get asked this quite a lot, actually. Um, obviously, if you're just putting in something like a 10 mil thick blanket, like the wall liner, for example, because you're only doing a basic upgrade, I suppose, um, you're not hugely changing um, the heat um, and the management. You're, you're making the internal area more comfortable for, for living in, but you're not actually drastically changing the building physics of the wall. Things like... Um, cutting it around socket boxes is not going to make an appreciable difference um, unless you've got a hole behind it, which you should probably block up anyway. Um, so certainly in low lower thicknesses, thinner boards, it's not such an issue. Um, you obviously have the option of surface mounting them afterwards. Um, and there are other ways of, of, of doing it with, with systems, but it's either surface mount them, keep them to a minimum, 
or except that if you're looking at a thin one, if you're looking at quite a big thickness, yes, that could be quite a significant bridge. But again, it depends, you know, like one small socket on a, you know, 2.4 metre high by three metre long wall is not going to make a massive, massive difference. But you could even put a piece of wrap there or our cold bridge strip behind the socket box and fix through to help reduce that cold bridge as well. So there are ways of tackling it. Good. And Pam, just quickly on the adhesive side, Alan's uh, mentioned on the comment, just a thought about the adhesive systems. Uh, these tend to be foam based as this compromise the breathability of the system. So I know you explained that the adhesives are the primers are breathable. Yeah. Um, can you expand a little bit on that for him, please? So, yeah, absolutely. So with the adhesive that we use with the um, wall liner system, because you're not using it as a full coverage it's not like you paint it on the whole surface it's like you use it around the perimeter to support the edge of the boards and um, to hopefully reduce any sort of movement and cracking at the joints there um, but you're also using it almost like a dab system so there is still breathability through it and also because it foams those air bubbles as you sort of push it onto the wall get it to seal etc they will pop so there is still still vapor movement through them um, you know, which is why it's not going to, to make any sort of long-term issues there either. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Pam. Um, plenty of questions coming in here. I'm going to come to email for one, please. Um, Jay, um, Julie has said, I've heard about installing air gel with stick pins. What does this mean? Uh, that's a good point. I mean, stick pins and the use of those is nothing new in our sector but if we if in the presentation we looked a lot about using aerogels in conjunction with some kind of facing board that isn't always the case sometimes it's supplied purely as a blanket in that format if you can imagine that a blanket which is really flexible doesn't have much structural integrity and if you put it on a vertical surface its inclination of course therefore is to peel away from the wall doesn't it so in that scenario what we advocate normally is some mechanical fixing it's typically a pin with a large head in it that goes back into the substrate and secures it back in that helps to mitigate quite cleverly because a really thin profile. The challenges we might see about somebody mentioned about thermal bridging and fixings. It's something that we've developed in that sense to kind of just come away from that negative step, that negative recorrection to minimize the impact that might have. So in a simple sense, it's just about like a big hat pin goes through the material to secure it back to a vertical substrate, typically speaking. Good, fantastic. Very so much. Can I just butt in for a second? Great. Oh, I've just noticed Dean's got a sample. Um, with fixings, if we know there's going to be a lot of large fixings or additional fixings, these are all included in the U-value calculation. So we know that we can put in either a plastic anchor fixing, a mushroom fixing, a stainless steel fixing. So we can actually do U-values and ensure that they still meet your performance and take in you know, any effects of cold bridging from fixings. And Ian's going to unmute and tell us that he has one. He, Ian has everything in his office. This is not planned. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got this stick pin here, which hopefully you can see. Um, so that that st sticks to the substrate, then the pin's left out, and then the insulation's placed onto that, and then a membrane is traditionally put on top of that. So it holds it in place. It's a good system um, where you don't want to penetrate the vapor control layer or breathe a membrane behind it and hold the insulation in place. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been used in a, as a solution for a, a number of cases. Uh, we use it at St. Sidwell's Point um, for the passive house. So, yeah, it's a good system. Good. And Ian, um, just stay on me for a minute. So Charles has said, so whilst localised fixings into structures may not affect thermal performance, what about interstitial condensation, moisture at metal fixings? Um, is care needed to avoid um, ferrous fixings? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a fair point. Um, <clears throat> just as Pam said, the, the localised cold bridging can be minimised and it's used in the calculation to take account of it. Um, but as the question has been asked about the condensation risk, yeah, it can potentially have a cold bridging condensation risk as well as the thermal side. So depending on what the construction is, we would have a look at that and try and minimize it um, from a condensation point of view. What we're trying to do is stop the cold bridge, obviously, from outside to in. 
So depending on what the construction is, if they get in touch with the technical team, we could discuss it further and reduce that as best we can. Okay, good. Um, and Mark, David had asked, how do you install the Space Therm A rated as an internal wall lining? Oh, thanks for that question. Um, well, uh, Space Therm A rated is our fire rated um, uh, 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 Space Therm product. Uh, and it's fixed in much the same way as the standard Space Therm. So if it's a wall lining product, then it's used as a gap fill, gap -fill uh, adhesive. Um, if it's um, a Space Therm Multi, then it's uh, shot fired onto timber straps and the same with the with the direct fix as well. Uh, I think probably one of the one of the beauties of using um, A-rated, uh, not not just because it's uh, fire rated, but um, just in terms of how, how you can work with it, um, it does produce a little less dust than the actual standard space them as well, but it's fixed in, in, in the same way as standard space them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we did have a question about the dust come in via email. I can't locate it at the moment, but is that something that people are able to expand a little bit more about it? So when you utilize the product, there is there is a, a perception of a little bit of dust when we're installing it. Um, Jay, perhaps you can talk us through that and and uh, afterwards go into a little bit more about the A-rated products, because we've had a general question um, in from a, from a viewer around that. So if you could do both, that would be great. Well, I think in terms of site safety, let's be honest, you know, we have to be cognizant of, about health. Health and safety is a requirement, legally speaking. And lots of processes on site will emit dust. Think about cutting faster board emits yeah. dust. So what we have to be aware of is specific recommendations that we put in place in terms of mitigating that risk. So typically we'd say if you're cutting material, the preference is to do it outside, do it in a well-ventilated area, to use the appropriate PPE that we'd recommend. But in the truest sense, none of the dust is necessarily harmful. It's just care has to be taken within that. Now, if somebody is installing space um, internally and they're cutting it internally, what's the knock-on effect for the rest of the tradesmen or tradespeople in that building? So just pay a little bit of care, a bit of caution about it, and just work in a very sensible way away from other people to mitigate that risk of dust spreading around. What was the second question you said about A1? Well, let me come back to you on that one, JHC. Ian, mm. would you just comment for me first, can we explain why this product is a little bit dusty? Could you just take them through the reasoning behind? I think that's quite important to share as well. Yeah, yeah um, it, it, it's a good question. The, the product is dust, dusty. Um, I do have a sample here. Um, so my room is full of samples and stuff. So I do have a sample here. Um, it's a fibre-based and an aerogel, silica aerogel, is impregnated into that base. Then it's dried, what they call supercritically dried, to maintain its thermal performance. Now, what that gives you is a very good thermally insulating product, um, which is highly water resistant. So you can put that material in a bucket and then go back to it a week later, dust it off, um, and it's dry. Bucket of water. But, bucket of water. Sorry, a bucket of water, yeah. So I have water here. This might not be very good on uh, YouTube, but let's try it anyway. So we have a product. Now, can you see that? It's like uh, mercury has been landed on the material, and it's Water, very water resistant, but that creates dust when you you cut it, and you, if you, especially if you're using mechanical cutters. So the, the mechanical cutters should have dust collection equipment to it when you're cutting it, and that reduces the amount of dust. So yeah, it can be dusty, but uh, as long as you take the appropriate measures that Jay mentioned. Um, it can be managed. Fantastic. Okay, Jay, sorry, I'll come back to you now. I just wanted to clarify that point first. Melissa has asked, um, just can you expand a little bit on the fire rated products and share a little bit more information about those, please? Um, yeah, I always use the phrase to say it takes a disaster in human life to elicit change, but we, we've seen that unfortunately with Grenfell. There's much more due diligence within our sector about fire safety. We know, of course, climate change is moving us towards material that give us better insulating qualities. And now we've got this other challenge that's on the horizon dealing with moisture management. But particularly when looking at relevant buildings, we know as a given, let's say, above 11 metres for most of our British Isles, the expectation is that materials in their external wall assembly would typically be A1 or A2, Euro-class non-combustible. 
in that sense, if there's more due diligence being pushed around that arena, then it makes sense that we also make sure we have materials that both meet and exceed that requirement. So it's driven by the needs of the market. In essence, we need materials that have a, a different level of complexity, different level of performance. So whilst within the auspices of things like moisture management, BS 525 by 2021, materials in this sense are scoring really well. So it really is sensible for fire safety, really great insulated, but also really cleverly managing that moisture model. Um, I think we'll see lots more materials coming to market around that spectrum, something that we as a business clearly are investing in. So any process we have which gives us more diligence around, around human safety, then of course that should be adopted, wide, wide ranging. Hope that okay. answers it. Thank you. Ian, as you're still unmuted, uh, and I'll be coming back to Pam and Mark soon, I, I'm going to jump back. I missed one here from Dave, um, who's quite a regular viewer. So uh, morning, Dave. Thank you for coming again. Um, Dave said, you show traditional stonework plan view, but this does not show the ventilated void uh, that is most common. Um, what is your solution for these settings? So internal wall insulation for ventilated void, lath and plaster. Yeah, um, morning, Dave. Um, <clears throat> we've obviously spoke before, and uh, I think what you're meaning here is the insulation system where I think it's traditionally the granite system that we've discussed in the past, Dave, but it would be the same for solid walls. Uh, if it is a vented cavity, then essentially by the U-value regulation uh, requirements for calculations, the vented cavity negates any thermal performance after the vented cavity. So if it is a vented cavity with thermal insulation, you wouldn't take the base material into consideration when we're doing the U-value. However, our tech desk, and hopefully Pam will agree with me here, when we do calculations on a solid wall, we tend to um, just take the solid wall into consideration and the thermal insulation as one. Because even if there is a cavity there, it won't be fully vented. If it was fully vented, we would take it out. But usually there'll be obstructions there, so it'll be partially ventilated. Um, so that's what we would take into consideration, depending on what that, if it is fully ventilated or not. Great, thank you very much. Yep. Um, Pam, Melissa's raised a question, whereabouts are we on EPDs being available for this product range? Um, yeah, uh, it's something that um, the company as a whole is looking at um, various things. We do have um, some information on it, um, but EPDs are in progress at the moment. Um, Ian and the sustainability group have been doing a lot of work looking at this, so it's just pulling all the, the information together. Um, so hopefully we will have something maybe early part of next year for, for some of our products. Um, we're still, you know, finalizing what we've got. I think that's safe to see because we don't have, um, we have some information, but not a full EPD yet. I think if I can just add to that, yeah. again, because I'm unmuted, sorry. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a fair point, and our sales team would be very much uh, supportive of this. We are trying to go through the EPD system, and uh, we are putting together the information. Unfortunately, it's not a quick process. Um, probably quicker than BBA, um, however, but... Uh, because we have to take so much information into consideration, it's not going to be a quick process. There's also quite a lot of people going through the EPD process. So even when you've put everything together, it needs to be finally validated. And the validation can take you sometimes longer than actually putting the information together. So as a general rule of thumb, we're talking six or seven months away. Um, but we'd be confident we would have EPDs for most of our products uh, the start of next year. Yeah, I think it's fair to say it's very important to us um, and we are committed to environmental footprint and the performance of our products environmentally as a business. Mm -hmm. And as Ian said, you know, there's a huge bottleneck in the industry. Everybody is looking at EPDs. Um, so we were in the queue before most um, one of our company policies. However, you know, these things do take time, as Ian said, um, but it is important to us. So good, good question to ask. Thank you for that. Jay, please. Sorry, could I just add that in the meantime, through that process, to mitigate some of that research and all that headache we find in collating data, 
many of our materials are now aligned with MBS Chorus. So if architects and specifiers out there use that system, it's quite an easy process to then bring and centralize the information through into their spec. So we appreciate the challenges in terms of time. Some of it's been done sort of behind the scenes for you in the meantime. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Jane. Good point. Uh, Mark, I haven't forgotten about you. Um, Bill has asked, do you need a vapor control layer with Space Serum? Well, it, it very much depends on the on the condensation risk uh, of the wall. There isn't really a, a hard and fast rule here, so it's so it's probably advisable to get one of our technical team to take a look and, and give you a steer, run the, run the calculations. Um, we, as you see from the uh, the presentation, we can in fact pre-install uh, a VCL into into space the wall board and, and direct fix uh, if that's required. But essentially, it's down to the individual project. Uh, and the wall construction. It, but if you were looking um, to install a VCL for, for, the, for the purposes of air tightness, then you might, might want to go down a different route because introducing a, a VCL may cause more problems than it, than it solves. So if air tightness was a concern, particularly in, a, in an older property, you may look to, uh, look to have a, a dedicated air tightness membrane that gives you the air tightness capabilities, but does allow that free flow of water vapor to prevent any condensation buildup. Um, as, as, as mentioned in the, in the presentation, we've got a, we've got a product called Wrap Therm that combines that thermal performance of the uh, space therm aerogel with our air tightness uh, membrane wrap uh, uh, type. So, so in essence, you're getting two for the price of one there um, uh, in terms of improving thermal performance and, and achieving good air tightness as well. Fantastic. Well answered. Thank you, Mark. Um, Pam, if I can come back to you, please. Um... Can Alan has asked, can the boards be used as part of a warm flat roof design? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Yeah, um, we do get asked that quite a lot. Um, it's going back to coining Ian's favourite phrase. Um, it depends. It, it does depend a lot on the construction um, and what that flat roof is being used for afterwards, etc. So in small localised areas that are maybe not um, trafficked, um, you know, they're not sort of like roof terraces or gardens, then yes, there is the potential to use it. Um, the main problem comes from, as we've touched on before, space is quite a soft material, so there is some compression. So for every 10 millimetres of blanket, you may be looking about one millimetre compression. Now, that doesn't affect the thermal performance of it, but what it can do is the risk is in a flat roof, whether that will then pop your fixings and damage your waterproofing layer. So really what we would like to do is get a better understanding of your, your proposed construction and work with you to see whether it can be used or what we have done um, in the past and discussed with people is how can we use the space them in conjunction with another type of insulation to facilitate uh, reducing the overall buildup as well as not compromising the waterproofing layer. So we, we can discuss you know, semantics about it and come up with hopefully a workable solution. Thank you, Pam. And while I've got you, I'm going to jump back to a question that I missed. We talked quite a lot about um, fixings and installation, just in case this wasn't covered. Um, when you shot fire the boards into the wall, presumably you're skimming the face of the boards, but does this conceal the nail head sufficiently? Yeah, um, because if you're shot firing with plasterboard, um, with our direct fix, um, obviously you've got the six mil ply and there's reinforcement, you've got the softer plasterboard, so that shot fire fixes in. I personally prefer looking at self-tapping screws for something like your multi, because then you can control where the fixing goes and you can countersink the, the plaster skim. So the answer is, is when you're if you're shot firing, it's worth trying to do some trials to make sure that you get the right force uh, with your fixing and your wall type to ensure that the fixing doesn't sit proud of the surface. If you do sit terribly proud, then you may end up having to increase the thickness of your plaster, which would be unfortunate um, if you're just wanting a thin skim. Um, but if you sort of get the torque right, you know, you should be able to mitigate it um, relatively easily. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Pam. Uh, one in from email here from Paul. We're installing mineral wool EWI on a solid brick Victorian house in London. So maybe another one that could meet with Jay at some point. Um, there's a decorative X arch external to the front door. We'd like to use curved and rendered aerogel in the arch, interesting, to minimize the thermal bridge. How do they do this? Ian, can I come to you for that one, please? 
Yeah, <clears throat> such a great project. Um, definitely one G you'll have to go and get photographs of. But yeah, it's uh, the benefit of the the space there, um, as we had here. It can create an arch, um, so you can have that flexibility, fix it, and then use a a, a wire mesh um, or similar to fix, and then you can render on the underside of that. We are working with um, an external wall insulation manufacturer for a system for that, um, well, not necessarily arches, but certainly for an external wall. Um, so we could quite happily um, give the specification for that, uh, which I think Pam put the final stages of yesterday uh, together in a document. So uh, it's coming at an opportune time. Uh, so we could deal with it. Great, fantastic. Um, Ian, can I stick with you here? Alan, a great question. Could the material become cheaper if it's more widely specified? Um, it is, after all, based on a simple material. Um, it is high in embodied energy in that sense, which makes it costly to manufacture. Yeah, um, it is a great question. It's a question that we've probably been posed since we've started dealing with this product over 10 years ago, um, that people think that once we, once this becomes popular, it'll become cheaper, um, which is logical. Um, so unfortunately, that's not been the case with this product. Um, it is a, a very unique product. It's very specialized. Um, not quite sure I would call it simple, um, but I, I, I think I'll take your point rather than offense. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it's there is a lot of energy required for it in terms of the critical drying, which I mentioned earlier. Um, that is using waste from a factory nearby, so it's not actual raw energy that's using to dry that material. But it is very specialised, so I don't see the price of it coming down dramatically um, but uh, from that point of view I'm going to take the technical card and uh, say that's uh, for the sales guys to answer on the price side of things um, but yeah it's a, it's a great technically it's a great product and I'm sure the sales guys could answer better on price. Yeah I think it's worth pointing out as well I mean this nanotechnology and the research that's gone into air gel products um, has been huge over the years and historically when we first became involved in the product it was only ever used in the aeronautical um, sector so you know outer space uh, missions all, all this stuff um, and what we did was we, we took it and did a lot of work and a lot of trials to try and um, work with a, a manufacturer to re-engineer to take these benefits and characteristics of the performance of the product which is perfect for construction, breathable, you know, completely water, completely repels water, very thermally efficient, and how we could apply that for use in buildings. So there's no doubt in time, as volumes increase, et cetera, of course, the product will reduce in price, hopefully. Um, but there's a lot of patents surrounding the whole technology. There's a, still a lot of research being done. So I think that's going to be sometime in the future, unfortunately. Jay, please. Can I just add, if anybody gets the chance, just Wikipedia Aerogel, how it came about, it's got a fantastic backstory, which is just a bit crazy on its own. But we have to understand that as a material, whether it's been innovated and developed, there's a likelihood and a plan that it doesn't have any degradation of service over 50 years. We've said several times about this, that it physically repels liquid water, whereas typically installed fibrous materials may absorb moisture and water over time, and that, of course, degrades their performance. So if the expectation of, let's say, an equivalent fibrous material is, is last than 20 years, give or take, we're going to have to replace that more than twice within the same period as, as, as an aerogel type material. So whilst, yes, there might be exponentially a higher cost at the start, the long term expectation through the program is it prevents all that secondary and third hand work going through that you retain that performance without any degra degradation. So in terms of a, an environmental model and a fiscal model, they actually fit really well together. That's a really good point, Jane. Probably something we don't talk enough about, actually. So that's um, piqued my interest there. Yeah, it's a great point. Thank you. OK, uh, still questions coming in. So please keep asking. As I say, we'll stay here as long as we need to. Um, Pam, is um, Wrap Therm available with A-rated space there? 
Yeah, I mean, we can do the laminate the A-rated to any of other other boards and, and wrap them. But what you do have to be mindful is that obviously whilst the insulation itself and in terms of the laminates, the board that it's used with is A-rated. As soon as you start introducing things like glue lines, etc., that may have an impact on your overall rating. And depending on your specific situation and circumstances in your project, that may or may not be acceptable. Um, you've also got to remember that the wrap tight itself um, is a class B free hanging and on things like um, calcium silicate cement particle board. So again, that might, the substrate it's going on may influence the overall performance. So quick answer is yes. The proper answer is have a chat with us first, please, so that we can talk through any implications that there might be and potentially you would need to run it past your fire engineer for approval. Good. Thanks, Pam. Uh, Bruce has also asked, Pam, Pam can you just mm -hmm. tell me what the Space Therm WRB system is, please? Oh, we get this on um, at least once or twice a, <laughs> a week. Um, basically, WRB stands for Window Reveal Board, which basically means we can supply the board's cut any of the laminates cut to suit the sizes of your windows. So for example, if you know all your windows and all your reveals are going to be the same size, we could save a lot of hassle in working on site by supplying you with all your strips of reveal boards for all your windows. The biggest problem is, is where you come to historic retrofitting, which is quite often where window reveal um, boards are important because you've got small spaces and you can't lose that space for your, um, you know, for your light coming in. And in those situations, it might actually be more cost effective to get boards and cut them to fit and suit on site, because it might be in some areas you can use a double strip and two end bits, you know, fixed together. So really, the WRB is the concept of uh, concepts. I'm not sure I like that terminology, but the WRB is basically the ability for us to supply you the pre-cut boards but that can be of any of the laminates. The one that we find we recommend the most for window reveals is the space there multi, simply because of space constraints. People don't have the space to put anything thicker. Yeah. Yeah, having personally renovated a Victorian cottage, that is the option that yeah. we went for. Uh, yeah. Very effective, I lad. Um, Mark, if I can come to you, please. Uh, Melissa has said, if looking to use the wrap therm product on an inner fit, a passive house project, uh, fixings for the framing added on to the to the wrap therm, would, sorry, would fixings for the framing added onto the wrap therm compromise the air tightness of that system? Uh, well, it's a, good, it's a good question. And um, it's no, there's no doubt we need to take some care here. There is a certain amount of self-sealing that the actual uh, wrap type membrane does actually have, but if it is compromised in, 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 in any significant way, there are ways to mitigate against that, and um, especially in a, um, uh, an NFIT project. So we have got a liquid flashing that, that could um, that could take over uh, that air tightness seal should you think it might become compromised. But ultimately, there is a there is a certain amount of self sealing with that with with wrap therm as well. Okay, good. I've been saving up a couple of commercial ones for you. Um, so, Mark James has said, "Where can I buy space therm?" Well, we've got we've got stockists uh, all over the country. So if you um, uh, give us a call and, and, and let us know where, where you are in the UK, you can get one of our regional managers to help you find a, a suitable stockist in your area. So, yeah, just give us a call and, uh, and and we can help help you out with that. OK, and still slightly commercial. Um, Alice has said, do I need approved installers for space there? Um, oh, well, absolutely not. So um, any competent labour gang or, or dry line. Uh, drywall uh, um, uh, installer would be ideally suited to, to, to install the product. Uh, an actual fact, we've actually seen a, a massive take up in the DIY market, um, you know, for space therm products where individual homeowners have, have, have installed space therm without any trouble. Um, notwithstanding that, we, we, we do offer uh, installation training and, and inspections um, uh, if, if, if you require them. But uh, but no, in essence, uh, no, there's no, no, no requirement for approved installers. Yeah, DIY is a big part now. Uh, COVID was interesting. I mean, I did the Lego. A lot of people wanted to re-insulate their old homes, uh, spend time doing that. So we got a lot of individual homeowners um, upgrading things, which is fantastic. Um, Jay, 
Um, well, so we're coming on to our last kind of three, four questions now, uh, just for the viewers. So if you have any more, please post them uh, now, email us or DM us on Twitter at Proctor Group in the meantime. Um, so, Jay, if I come to you, Jeff has asked us on Twitter, um, if air gel is thin and lightweight, can it be used to prevent thermal bridging? Yeah, that's kind of why, why we have it. It's been designed to create that barrier. If you think about the main kind of premise of thermal bridging, it's driven by conduction currents, typically molecular base, height transferring one to another. Actually, think about the graphic when we're visualizing it in the presentation. We saw insulation that was being installed in between timber studs, right? So typically in that scenario, the insulation is being designed to prevent thermal movement. It's there to insulate the heat in. The timber's just grown in a forest. So that's not there as, as an insulating element. So the understanding, if that's gone back to the solid wall behind it, that that's going to give a different path, isn't it? So in that sense, if you can use something like our cold bridging strip to face off those uh, those st timber stud works before you put the plaster or plaster board on, it works really well. It's not just in that context, but think about bulkheads, think about you know, exposed slab ends and things where you can't lower the ceiling height for whatever reason, but you need to get a certain thermal performance. It's it's a really clever, I, I term it as a get you out of jail card. We know that architects around the country, they get these challenges and it burns a hole in their brain. They can spend so much time and resource thinking about these technical challenges when the answer is staring them in the face, it's really easy just to use a small and under, underlying small amount of air gel in those situations to give them the maximum benefit. So absolutely, you, use it all you can in terms of a, a solution to challenging thermal bridging areas. Can I just say there's a really good article on our website. I think it might be in the news one. Maybe one of the um, the team can post it in the chat. There's a really good article written by Ian on cold bridging on a, um, with Space Therm. Um, that can be accessed and it actually goes into this in a lot more depth with some good isothermic pictures and images and um, explanations of an actual on-site project that we did. Thank you, Pam. Um, and Pam, last question for you. Sorry, I mm -hmm. um, caught you last minute. Um, Chris had said, can can he just use space there and blanket? So we talked about the different derivatives of and the, the different facings and backings. Can you just use the blanket? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we've talked about the dust and the fact that it's a fibrous finish. Um, so it does need to be covered in. But by using just the blanket, it does mean that you can actually have a lot more flexibility as to what your internal linings are. So, for example, things like curved stair walls, we would recommend using the blanket, pin it up first, and then your plasterboard or flexible plywood or timber cladding or plastic lining or even plaster could all be fixed over the face of that to, to, to meet the curves. It's great if you want to run a lot of services, but you want to maintain that integrity of the insulation. So you could use battens, either timber or a gyp liner type system to fix the space there and back to your solid wall, have your service cavity and then line it with plasterboard. So you're mitigating that cold bridging of your sockets, etc. Um, you can also use it as we touched upon, like the warm roof, but in walls in conjunction with other types of insulation. So, yeah, by all means, look at using it by itself. Obviously, one of the benefits of the laminates, it's a one board fix, but um, using uh, the blanket by itself can be a, a brilliant get out of jail card for tricky detailing. Good. And Pam, what about mould? Claire's just come in with a question at the end here. Um, does it have resistance to mould? Yeah, I mean, the, the, basically, the material itself is inert. Um, it's either a polyester fibre or glass fibre type base material, depending on the version we're looking at. And because it's not absorbing moisture, it's not really giving anything that would encourage mould. Obviously, in terms of this, this comes back to this assessment of the hydrothermal and, and the moisture and the temperature gradients, You've got to be careful about balancing that, especially in solid walls, solid traditional walls, um, to make sure that you don't get a point sort of between the junction of the space there and the wall where that could uh, happen. And that's where um, our hydrothermal analysis uh, can be very, very beneficial. Um, but just as a sort of a general, in most of the hydrothermal assessments that we've done, up to about a 0.3 U value, which is around about 50, 60 mil of insulation, they're pretty stable. Um, there's not that enhanced risk. So you know you can actually get a very, very good improvement on your wall without um, having problems of, of mould at that junction. Good, thank you very much. Okay, I think that's all the questions in for today. So thank you. It's actually been really interesting for me because it just continually reminds me of what an amazing uh, product that we are dealing with in the building construction uh, sector. 
and all the the performance characteristics of space thermia gel, you know, they're they're fantastic. So it's it's sort of a lot of good questions and things we already know, of course, as a business, but perhaps we don't talk about enough. So useful. Thank you for the great questions. Um, and if you're interested, you know, have a look on our website. We do put space thermia into different applications. So if you're interested in having a look at those, it goes into the oil and gas se sector in terms of insulating pipes. Um, it also goes into the rail sector for punk, point junctions on the railways and we put it into Formula One cars um, it's gone in CubeSats, it's gone into the sky so it's it's a really interesting product um, and you know one we really enjoy talking about. Um, Ian did you have a comment or have you just unmuted to? No he just remuted himself, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, okay, so another reminder for the diary, Friday the 25th of August at 10am is our next webinar. So again, an interesting one. That's a REBA accredited uh, webinar on air leakage and fire performance in facade systems. So an overview of UK and Irish building regulations relating to the compliance of construction membranes with respect to air leakage and reaction to fire. Um, and we, what we'll do is we'll do the REBA, REBA accredited webinar for you to watch, receive your certification, and then we'll have another Q&A with some fantastic uh, Proctor people um, towards the end. So personalised CPD certification for today is available on our webinar page, www.proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar. You should be able to sign up for our next webinar um, at that now. So after today, you'll receive an email with a link to a re replay link. So please feel forward, feel free to forward that to your colleagues and anyone you think may find it interesting um, and all the links that we've discussed today. There is a short um, survey in there. If you have time, please fill it out. We do read them. I read them all personally and it helps shape the future webinars that we do um, and I guess what you guys are looking for. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you for to the panel. Um, it's not easy answering these questions. Um, off the hoof when they're coming through. So well done, really appreciate it. And I hope everyone that's come along today can join us next month and have a lovely weekend.